There are two massive lies that are destroying people's psychology like acid without them even knowing it. And when you hear these, your brain is gonna connect a thousand dots to maybe some weird feelings that you've had throughout your life. Your doctors and teachers, the media, social media, marketing, your friends, and even your coaches lied to you. But the sad part is, they probably didn't know that they were doing it because they were lied to as well. This first lie I'm showing you here is already in almost every aspect of your life. And it's so hidden that there's not even a name for it. And I'd like to introduce you to this new concept that I'm officially naming cause blindness. So let me define what this is in real terms. Cause blindness occurs when a group or a person focuses heavily on some symptoms while they just ignore the cause completely. In the pursuit of a goal, people will tend to desire the symptoms of the achievement instead of the cause of those symptoms. So let me give you an example. Cause blindness is easy to see in people who desire wealth. These people might focus on the symptoms of wealth, like a Lamborghini or a giant house or even some expensive yacht. The cause of that wealth is almost out of focus entirely. The cause would be things like 30,000 hours of work and sleepless nights invested in personal growth and pitfalls and failures that lead to the discovery of a person's wealth. These deep personal sacrifices that were made and diligent, tireless hours spent obsessing and researching maybe a, a particular field. Another glaringly obvious example is just take a look at how many sales techniques are out there versus how many courses are out there actually teaching you how to make quality products. Yeah, pretty awful. So let's say someone wants to be more confident, for example. They might focus on the behaviors of competent people. They'll spend tons of hours studying speech patterns and movements and behaviors and all of these little things that competent people do. Then eventually, Someone will write a book about all these details, this full-blown reference volume of all of the symptoms of confidence. The belief is that if somebody could just get the symptoms all lined up in place, they're gonna feel confident and then they're gonna achieve their goals. This is kind of like someone telling you that taking duct tape and taping an orange to a bunch of random trees will make them all orange trees. Not really a good plan. Those oranges are symptoms of being an orange tree. So those behaviors of confident people are symptoms of a cause. They've spent their lives differently than other people. Their internal belief systems are radically different uh, from people without confidence. They aren't moving their body or speaking a certain way because they read a list of how to do it. Their behavior is a result of causes, not forcing a whole bunch of symptoms. So to sum this part up, their behavior is a product, a byproduct of confidence, not the other way around. The problems that a society as a whole faces are a byproduct of some cause. And these root causes are never discussed. So whether it's a deliberate effort to ignore the real sources of the issues, or maybe people in government grew up with the same belief systems that we developed just to focus on symptoms we might never know. But almost every problem we are facing as a nation or any society are likely a result of a lifetime indoctrination into focusing on symptoms and ignoring causes. If you're sitting down to write out your personal goals, focus on the causes that will make your goal a byproduct, a symptom. So instead of setting goals this year, think in terms of byproducts. So what are the byproducts I want to happen in my life? And once you've got a list of byproducts that you'd like to have, determine the causes that you need to make them all happen automatically. So when you see social issues or the news or politicians are getting you to focus on a new issue or a threat, remember that they're pointing to symptoms. 
and they probably don't want you looking too closely at what those symptoms are actually a byproduct of. So let's talk about the second enormous lie that you have been injected with. The public, which includes you, has been trained to either confuse or ignore the difference between pleasure and happiness. Our culture is wired to seek out pleasure while thinking that we're seeking out happiness. So we desire happiness, but we're seeking out pleasure on accident. We're bombarded from such a young age, just like the people who taught us were, by marketing and ads and television and media telling us that there's no difference between pleasure and happiness. And this blurring of lines was a deliberate and calculated effort to sell products and create a consumer culture. There was even a comedian, uh, Daniel Tosh, and I saw this just a few months ago, who spoke about this exact issue without knowing that he had also been manipulated. Check this out. Don't you love that one? Money doesn't buy happiness. Do you live in America? Because it buys a wave runner. You ever seen a sad person on a wave runner? Have you? So let's really dissect the difference between pleasure and happiness here. Pleasure is a momentary surge in dopamine that goes away. We then continue to seek more of it. So pleasure is experienced through one of the five senses, social media, drugs, a warm blanket on a cold day, a cocktail on a beach, buying a new car or a new purse. These are experiences that cause pleasure. Happiness does not depend on the five senses. It's an internal state of enjoyment and calm. Stuff that you experience might create an environment that could lead to happiness, but happiness does not depend on those things. Happiness is an attitude and a habit. Pleasure is a momentary surge. Another masterful explanation of this was from Dr. Jordan Peterson. And he shows us how hardwired a lot of us are to confuse these two things. And he did this on a, on a Joe Rogan podcast. Check this one out. I talked to, to, to one of the people that I was working with who had a, like a vision for retirement. I said, well, what's your vision for retirement? Well, I see myself in the beach, you know, some tropical country drinking margaritas. And I thought, oh, first, that's not a plan. That's a travel <laughs> poster. It's like, okay, let's, let's walk through this. All right, so you go down to this tropical country and you go sit on the beach and you have a margarita. It's like, okay, well, how many margaritas? Like 10? Okay, so gonna do that, what, gonna do that for six months? You'll be dead. Yeah, well, you'll be this like pathetic, sunburned, like- Fat. Yeah, yeah. unhappy, yeah. hungover, cirrhotic. In pain. Yeah, yeah, it's like, that's Dehydrated. your vision. Dehydrated. So uh, how long can you have a margarita on a beach? Like maybe you can do that once every six months for like 10 minutes, something like that. <laughs> it's not a vision. So for a moment, just consider how experts deal with solving critical issues like addiction or eating disorders, diet problems, exercise routines. Why do they all fail so frequently? It has to do with a chemical in your brain. It's a neurotransmitter called dopamine. And dopamine is a chemical messenger and it even acts as a hormone sometimes. It does a ton of stuff in your body but it's heavily involved in drive, motivation, and pleasure. So the experts fail to recognize this critical role of dopamine and what it does for our lives. Instead of remapping the brain's dopamine circuits, they tend towards asking patients to follow a new routine or to adopt some new habits. And their habits, like eating bad food or smoking, are rooted in dopamine. There's a learned dopamine pattern in place that must change before anything else can occur. This is non-negotiable. Okay, so let me tell you why this has the potential to ruin your life or completely change it. This part of the brain right here is called the reticular activating system or the reticular formation. So when you're shopping online for a brand new car, you're browsing around the internet, you're looking at hundreds and hundreds of photos of this car, you're really dissecting all the little details about it, you're, your brain thinks the car is really important, then you buy the new car, 
Then you start driving this new car and you're seeing it all over the place. You did not use language or anything to tell your brain that that was important. It saw that you thought it that was important, so it started searching the world for it. It's not like a whole bunch of people went out and bought the same car as you. As cool as you are, that's not how that worked. So you pay a lot of attention to something. Your RAS figures out this particular activating system, how to get more of it and how to find more of it. So the RAS, the RAS, needs to be retrained but the experts are focusing on the wrong part of the brain to change human behavior. So diet routines fail all the time, and they fail so frequently because they completely ignore the methods to change them in real life. So first, the brain's reticular formation, this RAS that we just talked about a second ago, prioritizes different behavior than the new diet. It's prioritizing the stuff that the person used to do. If we do things all the time, the brain memorizes patterns, which we call habits sometimes. So you have a competition between an idea and a habit. An idea lives in the top part of the brain. A habit is a little further down. Sometimes uh, people call this the mammalian brain or reptilian brain. These parts do not deal with the same things that we do up here as humans. These lower parts of the brains deal in emotions, impulses, and reactions. So this part of our brain can't speak English at all. It has no capability for language. So we can't rewire it using English. This is doomed to fail from the moment that it begins. We have to use the FATE model to control and rewire the lower parts of our brain and to change any behavioral pattern that we want. If you're not familiar with the FATE model, I did an entire video on this that you can check out in the description down below. But essentially, it's an acronym for what the lower parts of our brain are hardwired to respond automatically to. And these are focus, authority, tribe, and emotion, fate. Here's what all this actually means. The lower you go in the brain, the more likely you are to change behavior. So this is the hierarchy of influence. From top to bottom, this shows exactly what is the least important down to the most important thing to change the automatic response behavior of human beings. Doctors, coaches, and lawyers persuading a jury tend to focus on this least important part here, which is the top of the pyramid. Essentially, they all make the same mistake that amateurs do. And here's the mistake that they make. Trying to use psychology to change physiology. Your habits are physiology. Don't think in terms of psychology. Your habits are physiological changes in the brain's networks. So changing behavior might begin with modifying some thoughts and desires and ideas, but it's not going to produce anything real in the long run. So change your habits with the lower parts of the brain. You can do this. Think in terms of physiology and repetition and you'll do great. And if you haven't learned what the ridiculously powerful fate model is, you can click the link down in the description to check it out now. You can also download the free Chase Hughes app with the link right down below here and immediately access a ton of training and join social networks that are full of people who actually lift you up without ever seeing ads or being tracked across websites. So thank you for spending time with me here today and making this investment in yourself with these skills. You can message me anytime inside the app as well. Make today a great memory. Love you.